we're going to talk uh, about a very important subject related to our passion. And I wanted to start with this Bible verse in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, where it says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So the first curse that ever came upon man, you know what, what was the first curse? Uh, well, sin, sin is the consequence. It's what they did. They sinned. But God uh, sent a curse. And, uh, and on the New Testament, it shows us that the wage of sin is death. So when Adam and Eve sinned, God limited their, their life. They were supposed to live with God forever. So, but through sin, death entered the world. And guess what? The wages of sin or the payment for sin is death. So, but, but there's a gift of God. And we talked about God's gifts last week. So we finished here. And the greatest gift that we can have is the eternal life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, eternal life and salvation are two different things. Very often in church, we kind of mix and blend things together. We're saved. We were saved by, by God, by uh, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ at the cross. He shed His blood for you and me. And one of the gifts of salvation is eternal life. Eternal life. There's other gifts. And we, we've seen that He ascended to heaven and He gave gifts to man. So many of you want to receive God's gifts. Have you received any of God's gifts? Yes. Yeah. How many? A lot. A lot? <laughs> Have you received, uh, let's say, 5% of uh, these gifts? Or you don't know? 95%? You don't know. You know, the Bible says we receive them all. The problem is we don't take possession of those gifts. So as, as we learn the Word of God, we're able to enter in this new dimension. And today, the focus of this message is redemption. And why do I want to talk about redemption? First, I want to explain the meaning of the word, not just the religious meaning, but I want to go just to the dictionary. And this is the English dictionary says redemption is, number one, the act of redeeming the condition of having been redeemed. This is a bit confusing. So they put number two on the dictionary and they say recovery of something pawned or mortgaged. I hope you, you don't pawn anything, but, uh, but if you pawn something, you know in order to recover it, you need to pay for your, for your goods, for it, something that was yours. So this is the meaning of redemption. Also, the payment of an obligation as a government's payment of the value of, of its bonds. So, so, so if you buy government bonds, okay, the government, is, it's, uh, uh, they, they have an obligation to do the redemption of those bonds. The, also, deliverance upon payment, a ransom, a rescue. And finally, the dictionary puts number five, Christianity, salvation from sin through Jesus' sacrifice. So even salvation is in the dictionary. Isn't that a great thing? <laughs> so even the dictionary teaches about salvation. So this is the word redemption. But why do I want to talk about redemption? Because sometimes, and li listen to this carefully, we're talking about unleashing our passion, reaching our potential, you know, fulfilling our purpose. Sometimes we may fail to fulfill our purpose because we feel a personal obligation of redemption. Let me explain this. It, it's like uh, someone goes to jail because they've committed a sin. And you know, when people go to jail, sometimes uh, they convert it. Not, not a lot of times, but a lot of people actually in jail, they start to listen about Jesus and, and they convert it. And then they think about all the evil things they did. And they think, I need redemption. And so they, they change life. But they kind of force themselves to become Christian and to help others because they want to redeem themselves. Let me put it this way. Some of you, thank God you, you never met me before I was 24. Because at that time I, I, I didn't want church. 
I lived in a wild life of d doing all sorts of things that I shouldn't, including trafficking drugs. So uh, I've introduced a lot of people to drugs and some of them died taking those drugs. So I felt really bad about it. But uh, when I came to Christ, I felt even worse. And I felt so bad, so bad, so bad that I dedicated my life to work in the rehabilitation center, in a Christian re rehab. And I thought, well, I did so many evil things to other people. I want to pay back. I want to do, I, I used to say, I want to do for God twice as much as I did for the devil, at least. And so I was uh, working in that rehab center and for a season was okay, but then it became a burden and I was conflicted. I was very conflicted because by one hand I knew that now I had a new life, but I felt an obligation of redemption towards others. And listen to me carefully. Jesus Christ paid the price for our redemption. We don't need to do anything else. But what religion will put upon you is a burden of having to do things in order to earn your salvation. Are you following me? You know, I, I just love people that love the Lord. And some people, you know, serve God just out of, you know, their love. But I've met a few, let's say, Jehovah Witnesses that go door to door and Mormons and people that do all sorts of things, not because they love God, but because they have this fear of God, which is not the fear of God of the Bible, but it's being afraid that they will lose their salvation. So they feel they have to do something else or some other, they, they, will, um, they will do all sorts of different things. Now the word redemption in the New Testament has the exact meaning of purchasing a slave and purchasing that slave in order to free the slave. I know we don't have um, uh, slavery. Well, we do have some slavery. Some of you have slave jobs. <laughs> and I've been there. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> That's reality. But it's not slavery as, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, you still, you still had uh, slavery. You have slavery in certain areas of Asia, Africa, even in the United States and Canada, you have hidden slavery. You still have human, human trafficking and all these things. And, uh, you know, some of the electronics we purchased, probably they were, you know, uh, built by slave, slave workers in, in China or some, some, uh, somewhere else. But uh, it, at the time that the Bible was written, slavery was common. It was accepted. It wasn't something evil. It was just the way things were. And you had, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't just a, um, a, a matter, sorry for that, it wasn't just a, 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 like uh, recently slavery were, was viewed more like black, white. But that those day, in those days it wasn't like this. It was black, white, blonde. That didn't matter the race. You had slaves and you have the masters. And so uh, when, when the Bible says that we were redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, it means that God purchased your freedom and we are no longer in bondage to the law of the Old Testament. We are not longer in bondage to the things of the past. That's why the Bible says in Galatians, the first verse we've read, that Christ redeemed us from the law. So now we are free. Galatians 4, 5, it says that he died to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. What does this have to do with passion and with purpose? All. Because we were adopted by God. And this means that Jesus paid the price for our release. And the consequences of, of our sin were uh, are now removed from from our life so his death was in exchange for our life in fact the scripture says this was only possible through the blood of jesus christ so the reason why we as christians uh, worship god and people some people that don't understand this they say well christians worship a dead man 
uh, bl uh, bleeding on a cross. We don't worship a dead man bleeding on a cross. We worship the King of Kings that, yes, he died on the cross, but he's not there anymore. Amen. That's why, you know, we, we don't use in our churches, when we're in the church building, we put the cross, but Jesus isn't there. You know, uh, when I was young, I was raised Roman Catholic, and I had the cross with Jesus, and I, I liked that. It was in gold, and I, I kind of liked that. It, you know, it looked good in my chest, and, uh, <laughs> and I, I thought, well, this looks so good. But when I was saved, I realized He's not in the cross anymore. Amen. So we don't worship the cross. We worship God. Amen. And we really are thankful for what He did at the cross. Because we were adopted. And listen, passion is a consequence of redemption. Because we were dying in our sins, but Jesus Christ just came to hug us. Just came to save us. Just came to take us to the Father. You know, uh, in the book of Revelation, which, which is uh, the last book of the Bible, and uh, tells us about what, ha what is happening in heaven, uh, John, one of the apostles, he had this glimpse of heaven. He was there, and, and he describes it like this. There was, there was a lot of people singing. Those were the, the saints. Those were people, it, those were you and me. People that uh, believed in, in God, were redeemed, and now they're in heaven. He says, and they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood... You ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. So we have a lot of tribes here, right? We have Mohawk tribe. <laughs> we have, uh, you know, how many tribes? We have Polish tribe. <laughs> we have um, Venezuela tribe. <laughs> we have uh, Brazilian tribe. We have uh, Portuguese tribe. We have... Um, um, uh, I, I don't remember your tribe. Huh? Mauritians tribe. So we have Mauritian tribe. Ar Argentina tribe. We have more Haiti tribe. <laughs> African tribes. We have all sorts of tribes. Yeah? What's your tribe? Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> And, and I was so happy, I read on the newspaper that they want to annex uh, Turks and Caicos to become the 11th province of Canada. Wouldn't that be awesome? Amen. Huh? Wouldn't that be awesome? Imagine you can go on welfare on Turks and Caicos. <laughs> Install yourself under a coconut tree. I'm just kidding. Well, anyways, let us, let us continue. So, but the Bible says that he paid, he was slain. And by his blood, he paid the ransom. Shouldn't this be a motive for us to be passionate for him? Because you were adopted. So you, you receive freedom through adoption. You, you are not just uh, f uh, freed and now uh, God says, now you can go and do, do whatever you want. Now, now, now he says, now you're mine. You're my son. You're my daughter. <laughs> you have rights. You have rights to my blessings. You have a right to be in my presence. A slave that uh, committed to spend the rest of his life to redeem himself, it's, it's not a good thing. So listen, religion puts burdens on people. Religion tells you if you want to be safe, you need to knock on doors and go door to door do this. If you want to be safe, you want to uh, spend one year as a missionary and you interrupt your life, to do something for a church. If you want to be saved, you, you need to walk all this way to Lourdes in France or to uh, 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 shrines that, that are around the world. So religion puts burdens on you and says you were so mean. You know, now you need to do some good works in order for God to have mercy on you. Listen, works are important. We do good works. But we do good works not to redeem ourselves, but in order to please the one that adopts us. Amen. Just, just for the sake of, of showing God how much we love Him. Does this make sense? Yes. You know, some Christians, they know these things, but they keep forbidding him, themselves of doing fun, 
funny, fun stuff of enjoying life because of a, a, a kind of a, of a sense that they need to do uh, to work for God. Otherwise, you know, they're going to lose some blessing or some salvation. Blessings come in another way. I'll conclude this mes message by telling you that passion, that passion that we have for, for the Lord uh, is translated in, in evidences in our life. So when we're passionate for God, there's three major things that I observed that we all have. We, we, we have passionate worship, we do passionate service, and also passionate giving. And I'd like to mention this uh, briefly to you. What is passionate worship? Passionate worship is a, it's not just about being emotional. You know, when we do passionate worship, when I enter into a place and people are praising God, and you know, there, there's music in the church or whatever, and people are just, you know, you know like this. And, 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 you know, there's nothing that, are, that is connecting those people with God. L listen to me, sometimes I, I've been leading worship and I look to the church. And when I look to the church, I feel like just leaving the microphone and the guitar and just go away <laughs> to, to a forest and worship there. Because, you know, I, I prefer to worship in a forest where the birds are worshiping the Lord at certain places where people are just, you know, just waiting for time to pass. How do we do passionate worship? You know, one of the reasons why God said that we should approach Him with thanksgiving and we, with songs of praise, it's because God made us. And He knows that music causes something in us. You know, even my dog likes music. You know, when we're preparing, uh, uh, me and Andrew were playing the guitar, preparing the songs, even the dog wants to come there and listen to the songs. And it's, it's a dog. Now, when we come to, to church, we start singing. You know, th this is the reason we try to sing more contemporary songs, more uh, upbeat. And we put some songs even, you know, with a dance beat during the breaks and all that, and a little bit different. Because, listen, when, when people listen to music today, they don't listen to songs of, of 1930 or 19, uh, uh, 1835, you know? So, so those songs are great. But this is why worship needs to have, a, to have a progression so that when people worship the Lord, you know, they kind of have to like a little bit the music. But even if they don't like the music, I've disciplined myself. I can worship with any music. I can worship, you know, with, with old hymns, hymns from the, the 17th century. I can worship even with Gregorian chant. You know Gregorian chant? Hallelujah. You know those, those chants? I can worship for five minutes only. But I can. But, but as we start singing passionate worship, it's when we get to that point when we say, yes, he loves me. And, and we just, you know, abandon ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Someone was here last weekend that came through Facebook. And, uh, and she was telling me, oh, it's very interesting what you said about mounting up as wings like eagles. Because when I worship, I like to open my hands and do like, like an eagle. You know? And, and, and so, so if you feel to do like an eagle, just do it. But when we have passionate worship, this will connect us to God. And we need to engage in worship. Remember what we read about heaven? They're in heaven and they're singing a song. And what song is it? The, the lyric, I don't know the, the music. Maybe it's, it's a rap, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe Marlon is there and he's rapping all of this. And saying, what word is the lamb that was slain? And he paid the ransom. He paid the price. So that, in that corner, that, there's rock music. <laughs> then in my corner, maybe we're doing a heavy metal song. <laughs> you see, it's not that, the, you know, God created music. God created music. But we should have passionate worship. So when we come to church, just forget about everything. Just try to worship with the songs 
that we have. Number two, passionate service. Colossians 3.23, it says, And whatsoever you, you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, not unto men. Everything we do, everything we do. You know, when you wash dishes at home, you're washing dishes, you're cleaning the house, you know, do it as unto the Lord. So when you do these things like unto the Lord, you do it with excellence. You do the best you can. And people that are passionate are zealous people. And they're zealous about many things. Uh, you know, we're so passionate about hobbies, interests, you know, sports, uh, about uh, TV, about movies. You know, there's stuff we're passionate about. You know, some of you are so passionate about hockey. And, and you know, you're watching the playoffs and you just jump and you get mad and you get upset and you're so passionate for, for the game. Uh, you, you know, uh, and, and, and people are like this, they have passions. It's not wrong to have passions, but you need to have a passion for your service. Passion to do something for the Lord. Are you passionate for God? Passionate? Are you? I was reading about a, a preacher, a great revivalist named John Wesley. He founded um, a big church and, and God did miracles and people came from all over uh, to, to watch John Wesley. And they asked John Wesley, a, a reporter, they asked him, what is the reason why people come to hear you preach? And he said, I just set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. <laughs> is that a good one? Is that a good one? I just said, Lord, just I want to set myself on fire. <laughs> And, and, and what fire? The fire of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Final thing. Passionate giving. Passionate giving. Why is this so important? Passionate giving. Now let me mention the story of Mary. A woman that uh, purchased a very expensive jar of alabaster. A very precious jar. And this was, it had an expensive perfume. And, and she broke the jar. Just poured the, perf the perfume. And she did something completely unselfish because she could have kept the perfume for herself right do you, do you ladies ever bought the expensive perfume I know some people just buy cheap perfume that's not nothing wrong with that but uh, but if you if you want the good stuff the good perfume uh, sometimes you look at the price and you say whoa <laughs> so small a hundred dollars and, and to put on your purse a hundred dollars, wow, that's expensive. That was the kind of perfume that, that Mary bought. In fact, it was so expensive that represented about one year of salary for a normal worker. So imagine a, a bottle of perfume that represents one year of salary. So I don't know how much is your salary. It doesn't matter if it's 20, if it's 100,000, you know, it's the price of one year of work. And she just poured uh, in, in, uh, over the feet of Jesus. And then she cried. And she just uh, humbled herself. And she just used her hair to um, um, just spread that perfume over his feet. And you know what happened? You have the Bible verses there. She was criticized for her giving. You see, giving, it's not just give money. I'm not talking about giving money. To, to a church or to a ministry, we should do that. If we if we're uh, if if we're in a in a place that that feeds us spiritually, we should. But she's just giving her best, giving an offering, and the spirit of religion always manifests when we talk about giving. Some people get really upset. You know, we don't want anyone to get upset here at Passion, so we don't pass the plate. We just have you know a. A glass box at, at, uh, uh, over there and we invite you you know to participate and give to the Lord and you know fulfill you fill out the, the envelope and we'll issue an income tax receipt you know we'll do all these things but we don't want people to be upset because some people we say well, let's take an offering oh I, I'm not going here anymore but listen when you're passionate you want to give whatever money you want to serve. You want to give something. You want to, to give out of what the Lord blessed you. 
You, and uh, what Mary did was a great act of love on her part. You know, the loosening, the loosening of, of the, the hair represent, represents total abandonment. She was surrendered to Jesus. And she's doing this. And she was committed. She didn't have to prove her love uh, and, and lavish her perfume like that. But she wanted to do it. And Judas was very upset. He, he said, you know, we could have used this money to give to the poor. That's what the, the spirit of Judas will always say. Judas will, will want to, to use the resources and the giving for their own intentions and purposes. You know, when we give to the Lord, we gave. That's it. It's the Lord's. I'm, I'm just preaching this. I remember one of the first churches we, we opened. I will never forget this. Uh, there was this church in deep trouble and the pastor had left and uh, we, we had to take over of a small congregation and uh, and so it, it, it had about a hundred and something chairs about a hundred chairs I don't remember very well and the family came they didn't they didn't like me preaching so they said oh we're leaving and by the way we want to take the chairs we purchased for the church and I said you're welcome to take the chairs so you purchased this for God and now you want to take them Yes, we paid for those chairs. Okay, do you want to take some more? You know, some extra chairs? Just take it. Just take it. That's horrible. <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> it's awful. You know, you, when you give something to God, it's not yours. You gave it. You cannot take it back because you don't like something. But the spirit of Judas, the spirit of religion, will always want to criticize those that give to the Lord. Why are you giving? You're giving tithes to the church? Are you nuts? Are you crazy? Why are you doing that? You give 10% for a church? And, and this is what the world will say. But listen, we need to understand our call. And we all have an alabaster jar. What do you do with your alabaster jar? What do I mean by our alabaster jar? There's things that we have and skills and gifts that we have that God expects us to, to, uh, to use them for the glory of Jesus. Are you following me? God expects you to use those gifts for His glory. So what are you doing with your alabaster jar? Are you just keeping that alabaster jar? So these are the, the three evidences of, of passion in your life. If you have passion for God, you'll do passionate worship, you'll do passionate service, and you'll have passionate giving. Maybe you don't have any of these. Maybe you have one of these. Maybe you have two of these. But let me tell you, when these three things are alive in, in you, that passion touches the heart of God. And He will lift you up from the, the circumstances of your life. Passion will allow you to fulfill your destiny. This is what we've learned in the, in, uh, in the first session. Passion will take you to higher heights. We've learned this on the, our second uh, message. And today, uh, we, we also learning that when we have a, a burning zeal for the Lord, Passion will take us higher. Remember what uh, John Wesley said, I set myself on fire and people come at, uh, to watch me burn. Now, the last verse of this message, the last Bible verse. Many of us live oppressed by circumstances of life. Now, in the book of Isaiah, the prophet said in Isaiah 10, 27, and it shall be in that day, his burden shall be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. What is a burden? What is a yoke? Now, a, a yoke was set on an animal that had to do a routine. Uh, some of you, you your, your job, it's a terrible yoke because you don't like doing it, but you have to do it. And you keep doing that job. When it's like this, it's a burden. When you enjoy what you're doing, it's a passion. You don't work anymore. When, when you enjoy doing something, it's not work. If you're paid to do what you, you enjoy, that's awesome. 
If you pay to be a doctor and that's what you enjoy doing, you, you're paid to be a lawyer, you pay to be a singer, and you pay to be a soccer player, something, you know, you enjoy doing it. It's not work. But sometimes life takes you to a, a, a situation of a yoke, of a burden. You don't know what to do. But let me tell you, when you're passionate for the Lord, something happens. God's anointing comes upon you. And not only the anointing comes, but the, the burden is taken away from you. And the yoke is destroyed, is literally broken because of the anointing. And this happens when you have passion. Don't expect the anointing to come upon you if, you're not, if you don't have passion. You know, I, I enjoy praying for people so they can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, it's something amazing. And uh, every Thursday we'll be praying for people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, and, uh, and the, the best way to teach someone to be baptized in the Holy Spirit is, is, is to tell them, you know, just give your love to the Lord. Express it in words of passion. And when you do so, the anointing comes. The Holy Spirit comes. Suddenly the yoke is broken. That anointing that breaks the yoke is right here. And I would like to pray for you as we finish, as we conclude. Because passion is not only a, 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 you know, a way of showing our love to the Lord, it's a way of living. When, you, when you're passionate, you will fulfill your purpose. Passion will take you to places. Take you to places that are much higher than what you thought. And if you have these burdens, that passion will release God's anointing that breaks every yoke from your life. But you need to have your alabaster jar ready. Sometimes there's something that the Lord expects you to do. And, and, and when you do that act of, uh, act of passion, when you do that, that, that showing of love for the Lord, maybe nobody else is seeing what you're doing. People don't have to see your passion. But God will appreciate that. And when God sees your passion, the anointing that breaks the yoke, is manifested. God takes you to higher heights. And, and, uh, and listen, I want this church to be a place of passion. That's why the leaders, we, we were together and, and we prayed about it and said, you know, passion. It's passion. We want to be passionate for God. Passionate for people. Passionate for souls. Passionate for the world. And when you have the, this passion, imagine this church, all of us on fire. You better believe that people will come to see you burn. Amen. People will come to see what's going on. People will see, oh, there's an anointing there. Look at that. Look at the way they worship. Look at the way they serve. Oh, the, the, the worship times are amazing. You know, God is, the presence of God is there. Amen? You want to be that kind of people? Yeah. So let us all stand. We're going just to praise God. Amen.